Ignorance has traditionally been perceived simply as a problem, as a gap or a void that once recognized needs to be filled. However, increasingly, ignorance is coming to be seen as something more interesting. Today, ignorance and knowledge are positioned relationally, dynamically. And in comprehending this relationship, new fields of study are emerging. Thus, we now have the sociology of ignorance and the interdisciplinary field of ignorance studies. However, what, if anything, has this to do with nursing? Hello, my name is Martin Lipscomb, and I'm joined by Professor Amelie Perron of the University of Ottawa. Amelie skillfully answers the question I just posed in her contribution to the forthcoming Routledge Handbook of Philosophy and Nursing. Professor Perron, thank you for joining me, please. Can you outline the main argument of your chapter in the handbook? What do ignorant scholars have to say to the way an absence of knowledge organises our understanding of and actions in the social world? What are crudely the effects of ignorance on nursing, on nursing care? So the the premise of the of the chapter was that we need to pay more attention to the way that ignorance intervenes in nurses' lives. Ignorance is a uh, probably a very uncomfortable word for a lot of nurses. We don't want to think of nurses as ignorant or as a nurse in the nursing profession as an ignorant profession. When we move away from the strict terminology of ignorance and we pay attention to what it actually means and what it represents, it, it makes more sense. Ignorant scholars um, have actually developed this field for the past 30 years. Um, but we, we're not aware of this in nursing. And actually, I would argue that uh, in even the philosophy of science and in sociology, it hasn't made its way. This field of study hasn't really made its way yet. Um, and I don't think it deserves the full recognition that it deserves yet. I think that we will get there. And I hope that the health sciences and nursing will also catch up uh, to, that, uh, to that movement. But what ignorant scholars are telling us is that there are we're, we live in a society where we think that knowledge drives everything that we do. And if it's not knowledge, then at least it's a will to knowledge. We are driven by curiosity. We are driven by the things that we know. The uh, We're driven by scientific facts. We're driven by, by research, by um, intellectual discussions to answer complex questions. And when we secure that knowledge, we are able to act on it. We are able to make decisions. We're able to develop policies and so on. Ignorant scholars nuance that thinking by saying, actually, it's not so much knowledge or will to knowledge that drives society or that drives social life or political life. It's actually ignorance. It's the things that we do not know. There are so many ways of not knowing something. It pervades our lives. And it's um, uh, the ensuing argument is that it pervades all aspects of our lives, not just individually, but collectively. And it's embedded in social and political systems. So we have to move away from strict terminology to pay attention to the ways that we don't know something or that we cannot know something or the ways that we refuse to know something or maybe we refuse for others to know something. So for example, if I'm um, engaging in um, deception, for example, deception actually is connected to ignorance because I hold a certain kind of knowledge and, for example, I don't want you to know, so I'm going to withhold that knowledge. So ignorance is embedded and uh, underwrites this, uh, this process, but we don't call it an ignorance process, even though it is. There are multiple examples of this. Um, tradition, for example. When we engage in traditions, we work with an assumption around what we are supposed to be doing in certain cultural or social contexts. And we don't question those traditions. We don't question the basis for that knowledge. We just accept it and move forward with it. So there is uh, ignorance underpinning this process because we are not asking certain questions. So we are withholding a certain curiosity. We are withholding the possibility of exploring other ways of approaching certain situations and engaging in them. In nursing, uh, in healthcare more broadly and nursing more specifically, ignorance is very much present in everything that we do. When we engage in confidentiality, for example, when we protect patient confidentiality, 
we are making decisions about withholding information about a patient's chart or a patient's background or a patient's uh, health status. And we are making decisions about who has the right to know this knowledge, who has access or who should have access to this information, whether it's our colleagues, whether it's a manager, whether it's child protective services and so on and so on. So confidentiality is, is, is always present in, in nurses' practices. We don't think of confidential confidentiality as being connected to ignorance, but it is because it is inducing willfully inducing ignorance in other people for you know for moral uh, moral reasons. But it is still a driver of ignorance in uh, in healthcare settings. Uh, when we omit to document or to chart certain things because we because we think it is not relevant because we forget or because we get interrupted and that charting kind of gets left undone that happens on a daily basis for for healthcare professionals and nurses in particular again another driver of ignorance without being called ignorance per se so when we move away from the terminology we realize that what we know can be quite limited compared to what we actually don't know and how we navigate these ignorance processes in our everyday activities and especially in our professional activities as nurses. So the premise of the book was to, you know, base, uh, you know, to kind of draw out other examples of how ignorance can be a powerful driver in certain um, institutional contexts where nurses are implicated and that nurses have to navigate. So I use the case study of a nurse whistleblower in the United States. Uh, this is a, a registered practical nurse, Don Wooden, who blew the whistle on the mistreatment of uh, migrant women who were detained in um, immigration um, enforcement agencies. Uh, and what Ms. Wooden blew the whistle on was that migrant women were suffering gynecological, uh, gynecological abuse at the hands of a particular practitioner in a nearby hospital where migrant women were being sent to to receive, to receive care. And when you unpack this situation, you realize how it's a, it's a prime example of how the actions of Ms. Wooden and also everything that led to her blowing the whistle are knowledge and ignorance brokering events. And in the chapter, I kind of unpack many of the events that took place, the discourses around these events, how they were framed, how they were interpreted, and uh, what kind of decisions they led to from uh, certain uh, other members in this, uh, in this uh, migration and detention uh, context. And I also emphasize how knowledge and ignorance interacted and how ignorance actually drove part of the uh, investigative report that was, uh, that was released following a deep investigation into the allegations by Ms. Wooden. And, uh, allegations that were also strengthened by uh, accounts from migrant women themselves and other uh, other nurses in the um, in the detention facility. And when you unpack this particular situation, you see how you think the situation is about one thing, but then you realize that so much more was going on and was driving the decisions that were being made at the leadership level in order to engage with certain types of information while also staying away other types of damaging information. And I talk about how, what, what uh, kinds of implications this has from a nursing point of view, not just in relation to nurses practices in these types of contexts, but also in relation to what we mean by nursing research, nursing, um, nursing policy, and um, nursing education as well. So those connections are there. And when we, when we use case studies such as this, uh, we can unpack so much more and highlight the contribution of ignorant studies to our field. Thank you. That was really interesting. And, and your chapter is, um, is, is fascinating. Thank you. Now, lots of questions jump out from what you've just said and also 
the chapter that you wrote for the handbook. Too many questions to address here. Nonetheless, let me ask you, it can be difficult for nurses to recognize, let alone um, absorb relevant developments occurring in non-nursing fields. And your work recognizes this and you attempt to bring the sociology of ignorance and ignorance studies to a nursing audience, something you do very well. However, would you say a few more words about the problems nurses and nursing faces in learning from disciplines that can be seen as alien or other to our core concerns? I am persuaded by your argument that the sociology of ignorance is relevant to nurses and nursing, yet it would be easy to overlook this important field of study. How might nurses keep abreast of these and other um, kindred developments? So, of course, because the you know ignorance studies is um, is a multidisciplinary field uh, drawing from sociology, um, political philosophy, political sciences. Um, feminist uh, feminist scholarship as well and so on and so it seems quite remote from from what nurses do and what nurses know and the kinds of um, the kinds of interests and that they have in moving the discipline and the profession forward it's a mistake however to keep those fields separate and to think that they may not have anything to say to each other and part of the work that Trudy Raj and myself um, have done is trying to build some of these bridges, cross-disciplinary bridges, to say you actually have a lot to say to each other. Ignorant scholars have not identified, have not engaged with the healthcare domain as a field of application, despite all of the possibilities. I focus on nursing, uh, but there are many other angles to approach this. And um, I think that there's uh, there's several reasons why some of these bridges are not happening, and certainly from nurses' point of view, this type of this type of thinking, this type of of reflection, is tends to not be part of the discussions that we have in our profession. They tend to not be part of the curriculum either. I think that uh, some of the um, explanations for this is that it doesn't really have any direct relevance. To, to nurses' work and what nurses need to know, quote unquote, what they need to know in order to, to function or to perform uh, in current uh, healthcare systems. However, I think that the it's, it's a mistake actually to not engage nurses in those discussions because I speak with, through conferences and workshops and seminars, I speak with frontline nurses on a very regular basis. And I talk about these things and I make them very accessible and nurses absolutely get it and they make the connections and they see the relevance for their practice and they actually take the thinking further than I could um, in, in drawing these parallels and deriving new meanings from the experiences that they have in their, in their daily practice. I think that we need to properly trust nurses' intellect and their ability to engage with these ideas. Um, and I'm, I don't think that we do that quite enough. It's true that some of the terminology, um, some of the wording can be can be challenging and can be can be dense and heavy. In the work that uh, Trudy and I have done, um, we have tried to make this more accessible and to make those connections easier to grasp. I'm also currently working on an edited collection with contributors some of whom are not scholars, some of whom are uh, nurses, uh, practicing nurses. Uh, some of them are um, beginning their, their um, academic careers and working with them to, to, to um, uh, explain some very real scenarios uh, that nurses deal with in relation to, you know, providing care to certain populations in vulnerable contexts, um, working in certain policy environments, working with certain types of uh, research traditions, and looking at how in each of these situations, ignorance studies have something to teach us, and explaining this, outlining it in, a, in an accessible language to again, build those bridges that I think are missing uh, currently in both uh, nursing studies and also ignorant studies so that the two, the two speak to each other. And I hope that uh, we can certainly make this um, uh, easier to, uh, to comprehend so that people can see the potential for this particular 
uh, field of study, even though the name, you know, ignorant study or the sociology of ignorance may be off-putting. Um, but as I said, there's there's so much more to unpack there. And I think that if we are not engaging with this, I think that nursing runs the risk of staying too comfortable with certain traditions of thought in, uh, in nursing and sticking to certain explanations that need to be challenged and need to be problematized. And we need more sophisticated um, engagement with uh, in, in, in trying to understand what happens to nursing care environments, what happens to nurses, what happens to care recipients who receive care from nurses. And I think Ignorance Studies has the potential to provide a lot of these explanations. But again, um, we need to make this a little bit more accessible. And I hope that uh, the work that I'm doing um, can can do that, hopefully. Fascinating. Uh, thank you. It, it, um, your chapter, again, is, is very readable and very interesting. Uh, only leaves me to say, Emily, it's been a pleasure talking to you. And for information, links to Professor Perron's work and the Routledge Handbook of Philosophy and Nursing are provided in the accompanying notes. Amelie, once again, thank you very much. Thank you, Martin.